大的参与，掌声鼓励你们，谢谢。谢谢 Right, our next speaker, our next speaker. So uh, this time we have uh, speakers from Singapore. We have uh, speakers from different industries, from hospitality, from manufacturing. We have HR speakers. We got general managers as speaker. And for the first time, we have an author. We have an author. We have an author as a speaker. So Jimmy Dixon is the coach, as a coach, as a trainer, and the author of Shifting Paths book. Right, we'll talk about both later. Um, Jamie is a, a trained consultant coach and author of Chevy Pass, how to design and deliver practical training. Originally from the UK, Jamie has been based in China since 2006. His working background is in HR, having worked in recruitment and later on as training manager at Amway in China. Uh, as a trainer, he has worked with over 120 different multinational clients throughout China and the APAC region. He del delivers training in both English and Mandarin. Uh, uh, Jamie's focus area is on helping people connect with others. This involves helping people communicate more assertively, influence others, lead others, and present their ideas through, through storytelling. So the topic for Jamie is about the need for practical training design. Can we have Jamie? Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about practical training design. And this is a subject that has been very, very important for me for the last six years. And I believe it's an important subject for the future of training and all kinds of training. And I'm going to share with you a bit about why practical training is very, very important, what practical training is, and more importantly, how to make your training more practical. Um, so first of all, a bit of a story about my background as a trainer. About 10 years ago, I was working as a training manager, and I had a regular office job, working in the office, hiring trainers, and coordinating training projects. And I decided that I wanted to be a trainer as well. I didn't like sitting in the office all the time. I wanted to be out delivering training. And so I made that decision. And when I decided to quit my job and become a trainer, I was very, very happy. And then I quit my job, and I became a trainer. And I discovered it's actually not that easy. It's actually very, very hard. I have to stand up in a room in front of lots of people tell them how to do their jobs several times a week. And I found it really, really hard when I first started. And I made lots of mistakes, and I delivered some bad training at first as well. And through time and experience, I started to do some things right, but I still did some things wrong. But every time I did something right, I didn't know why. I didn't know why it was working well, I didn't know why people liked it. I was relying on luck. And so I decided I didn't want to rely on luck. I decided I wanted to be able to consistently give a good training experience. And so I went and I read a lot of books about training, about training management, about instructional design, about psychology. And I, I learned some answers. I got some answers to my issues my training started to improve. But there was one thing that I found for China in particular is very important and is not so important in other markets. And it is practical. And I just heard over there, for example, this is a question that comes up in almost every single training. And it's something that people really care about over here in China. And so I had to start looking in other areas to learn about how to make training practical. Because there are so many books about training design out there, and none of them talk about practical. They talk about how to tell a good story. They talk about how to write a training objective. They talk about how to run an activity. But they don't talk about how to design a training solution that people will actually use back at work. And so I spent six years looking into the fields of product design, emotional design, user experience design, 
And I had to start writing my own book to be able to answer these questions. And after six years, I was finally able to finish this book. And you can see how big it is. Um, it took me a long, long time to write. And I'm going to share with you some things from this book today, um, some key, simple things. If you would like to learn more about the book, and after this presentation, I will be at CJ's booth over there, and I have 10 free copies to give away. Um, that's a thousand remedies worth of books, because it's not cheap to print a book that big. So first of all, why do we need practical training? Well, uh, everyone here who has ever attended training some of us might have delivered training as well, or observed training. I'm pretty sure we all have experienced bad training. I have seen bad training, I have delivered bad training, and I have observed bad training. Bad training exists. And when the training is bad, it's normally for several reasons. Uh, one, it's irrelevant. I'm sitting here, here, I'm listening to this training, and I think it's not helpful. It's not what I need. It's not related to my job. I can't use this. Another thing about bad training is it's complicated. There's so much theory or best practice, but I can't think how I could use this in my work. It's too complicated. I don't have that much energy. I'm too busy. And another reason training is bad is it's inefficient. Perhaps we have a four-day leadership training, and really, it should have just been one hour. And we waste so much time on training, bad training starts to get a bad reputation. Um, and unfortunately for bad training, reality is coming. Reality is that people these days are so, so busy. And I have seen over the last few years, people have less time for training. Originally, we might have had a three-day leadership program. Now it's a one day. Next year it might even be half a day. People are busy, they don't have time for training, and even when they are in the training, they still don't have time. They're distracted, they're trying to do lots of other things. And another thing is that people's expectations are increasing. Everyone has been to bad training. Everyone knows what bad training looks like. And as soon as they see the training is bad, they walk out. People have really high expectations for training. And the final thing, I don't actually have any data to prove this one, but I believe that as big data starts revealing more information about our training, we will be able to see just how much time I spend in a training telling jokes, how much time I spend in a training telling stories, how much, I tell, how much time I spend in a training playing fun games, and just how much value each of these activities created, and just how much time each of these activities wasted. And I really like my job. I, I love my job, actually. And I really hope that in the future, I can still continue doing my job. And so when the future comes, and there's all of this data to show just how much of my training is creating value, and how much of my training is wasting people's time, I really hope that I can still keep my job. And that was part of the drive for why I wrote this book. And so this is why we need to have practical training. Because in the future, there is no room for bad training to hide. But what is practical training exactly? Well, practical training, I can summarize it in two words. One is useful. You can actually take it and use it, and it works, and it helps you, and you want to use it. It's useful. And the other thing is it's simple. We don't look at all of this theory. We don't look at what these CEOs in Silicon Valley do. They, they wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning, they meditate for two hours, and then they go to the gym for three hours. Most people don't have time for these things. But it has to be simple, something people can do just a few seconds or a few minutes, anything more than that, and they won't be able to do it. So practical training is useful and it's simple. So I'm going to share with you now four key steps that we can follow 
when we are designing training and delivering training to make our training more practical. And if you'd like to learn more, again, there's a lot more information in my book, but I'm only going to share four steps today because we don't have much time. The very first thing, any training need, any training need, it might be a leadership training, it might be other soft skills training, it might be a technical training, it might be onboarding training, any training needs, you will always have two key stakeholders. One is the learner, the person sitting in the room actually doing the learning. And the other is the investor, the person paying money for this training. Now, sometimes the investor and the learner are the same. If you've ever attended a coaching certification workshop, you might have paid for that by yourself. You are both the investor and the learner. But in most corporate situations, the investor and the learner are different. The investor might be HR. It might be the learner's manager. It might be the CEO. And what we need to do is we need to make sure the investor and the learner's needs are in balance. But unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. What I've experienced a lot in my position working here in China, I get a lot of overseas training companies and overseas clients come to me and say, we're launching our global leadership program and we need someone to deliver it in China. And so I come and deliver it and then I discover the problems. And the problem with a lot of these global programs is that they're too focused on the investors. They've been designed in the headquarters in Europe, in America. They have not consulted anyone in China. They've only thought about the competency models, our organization's goals, and the CEO and the senior leaders and what they want, and this is everything we want. And then they push it out. And when I get to China, people say to me, I can't use that, or the CEOs don't understand what's happening in China. So when we have too much focus on the investor's needs, you get learners who are not motivated. And motivation is extremely important for training. Because when the training finishes, when they go back to work, that's when we see if they really learn or not. <coughs> and if they are not motivated to learn, then after the training, they give up. They forget everything. If they are motivated to learn, then after the training, they will take what they've learned and they'll start using it. So we can't be too focused on the investors. At the same time, we also can't be too focused on the learners. So I, I spoke to an organization a few months ago. They came to me, a company here in Shanghai, and they said, Jamie, we would love to run a presentation skills training for our staff. I said, that's great. Um, why would you like to run this training? Well, we did a survey asking them what training they need, and they said uh, they would love some public speaking skills training. Okay, that's great. And how will public speaking skills help them in their jobs? It won't. Um, they, they don't really need to do reports in their jobs. They don't really need to do presentations in their jobs. They just think it would be fun. Okay. <laughs> I told them to find another trainer. Because if I do that training for them, I'm wasting their money. And we can't be too focused on the learner as well. What we need to do is we need to keep the, the investor's needs and the learner's needs in perfect balance. Now, how do we do that? How do we make this more deep? Two key questions. The investor always wants a return. If I give you money, it's not because I'm a nice person because I expect you to give me a good training in return. Now with training, we've talked about ROI, the talks of value, the training before. It's impossible to measure. Don't even think about measuring ROI. But the thing you can measure is expectations, the return on expectations. What does the investor expect from this training? Maybe they expect that my customers will no longer complain that my staff are unprofessional. Maybe they expect that the next time I hear my team members giving a report, I can actually understand them and they're not wasting my time. So clarify what their expectations are and make sure our training will actually meet those expectations. 
And then for the learner, we need something called intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is when they are actually motivated to learn. Extrinsic motivation is when they are motivated to attend the training because their KPI says, I need to attend five days of training this year. And that's when we get the last week of December, we get three people come to training and say, uh, the only reason I'm here is because I have to attend five days of training this year and the year's almost up and I still have two more days to attend. So if we want to learn about their real motivation, we need to know what are their problems. Maybe they're working too much, they're working too many hours, and they want to work less hours. Maybe they're too stressed. Maybe they want to negotiate a pay rise with their boss. What are their problems and what are their goals? Let's make sure that we can link the training content, the training objectives with their motivation and the investor's expectations. So let me give you a little example. I'm gonna run through a very simple case study here. And this here is Sally. She's not a real person. I'm not sure if you can see that. Now Sally is a new manager. And she's just recently been promoted uh, to a new managerial position. But she's struggling a little bit. She's so used to doing things herself that she doesn't let other people do them. She doesn't trust other people, and so she might go manage. And in the end, she tells someone to do something, she watches them do it, she finds a mistake, and says, I am a good person. <laughs> and then she comes and she does all of the work by herself. So this is quite a common issue for a lot of new managers. And Sally's manager comes to us and she tells us, I've got Sally, uh, Sally's having really big problems. Uh, and I expect Sally to stop doing all this work and to actually start managing people. I also expect her to work less overtime. If she works too much overtime, she's going to get stressed, she's going to get burnt out, she's quit. And also, I really hope she reduces her stress. It's really annoying when she just complains with it. So then we go to Sally, and we ask Sally, what are your problems and goals? I understand a bit about her motivation for the training. And she says, I have too much work. I really want to reduce my workload. Um, I wish my team members could be more proactive. And I really wish I could just enjoy my job again. And so if we look at Sally's manager's expectations and Sally's problems and goals, we can see that they're aligned. And that's good. When they are in balance, when they're aligned, we are good to go. So now we can start thinking about a solution. And a possible solution for Sally's situation might be coaching training. Now everyone wants their manager to be a coach and to develop good coaching skills. So maybe Sally would be a good coach. Now, um, when we think about coaching normally, I don't know what you think, but in my mind, I think one coach, one coachee, they're sitting in a meeting room for one hour, the coach asks questions, the coachee reflects, answers questions, the coach listens, summarizes, challenges, they go through the GROW model, Starting with a goal, reality, options, will, and at the end they finish with an action plan. Is this going to be the right solution for Sally? Let's have a look. And to find out, we can do something that I call application context analysis. A simpler uh, name for this is learn the learner's world. Learn about the learner's world. Now, if I'm going to propose coaching, as a solution for Sally. I need to understand a bit more about her world. Is coaching going to fit into her world, or is it going to be hard to fit into her world? And I can analyze Sally's world, I can analyze Sally's context from five different angles. First one is time. I can ask, when Sally has an opportunity to coach, what time is it? How much time does she have available to her? And what's going on at that time? Actions. When Sally has an opportunity to coach, what is she doing? What was she doing before that? 
What's she going to be doing after that? When Sally has an opportunity to coach, what environment is she in? What's that environment like? What resources are available? And when Sally has an opportunity to coach, how is she going to be feeling? Why is she going to be feeling that way? And how is she responding to those feelings? And when Sally has an opportunity to coach, who are the people that she is coaching? What other people are around her at that time? What's her relationship like with those people? So I go and speak to Sally. I, I might make a quick phone call just to ask her these questions. And I learned a little bit. I learned that, you know, honestly, Sally, I, Sally's a busy person. And she's a new manager. It's chaos right now. She doesn't actually spend that much time one-on-one -on -one with her staff. Um, most of the time, she only spends a few minutes with her staff here and there. What actions is she doing? Most of the time, when she's with her staff, she's walking around the office, and she's going to ask them, eh, and always pushing them. And that's what she's doing when she has an opportunity to coach them. What's the environment like? Well, she works in an open office. Uh, it's very noisy. There's lots of people around. They have some meeting rooms, but the meeting rooms are normally booked, so she can't always use a meeting room. What's she feeling? She's normally feeling really impatient and rushed. Uh, she's normally chasing people and pushing them. And who are the people? Well, normally she speaks one-on-one -on -one with her staff, but there are other people sitting around, sometimes just on the same table. So they don't have much privacy. So if we think about coaching, and we think about one-on-one -on -one coaching, sitting down in a quiet room for one hour, uh, and we go through the draw model, and Sally just asks her stuff questions, and encourages them to reflect, and pushes them to make an action, an action plan. Quick question for you. Do you think coaching is going to work for Sally's situation? Yes or no? <laughs> no, it's not going to work. So when we do this application context analysis, we start to realize why training might fail. It's because the solution we're proposing can't be used in her world. Now, there's a little bit more to this, and I'll only go over this very quickly, but this is one of my favorite models. It's called the BJ Fogg Behavior Model. And it's developed by a behavioral scientist, Professor BJ Fogg, from Stanford University. And it's to help us understand how people change their behavior, and if they can do this behavior or not. And whenever we want someone to do something, we need to ask two questions. Number one, oops. Number one, what is their motivation for doing this? Is their motivation high or is their motivation low? And number two, what is their ability to do this? Do they have a lot of ability to do this? Is it easy for them to do or is it hard for them to do? And you can see this curved line in the middle. This is called the action line. When the, when the behavior is above the action line, they can do it. When the motivation and the ability are high enough, they can do it. But when the behavior is below the, behavior, the action line, they won't do it. They don't have enough motivation and they don't have enough ability. Now, if we look at Sally, we think about her, her, her motivation for coaching. If she's a new manager, she micromanages people, she's impatient. Do you think her motivation is going to be high, moderate, or low? What do you think is Sally's motivation to coach? High, moderate, or low? What do you think? I know. Personally, I, I'm going to say moderate. And she sees it might be a good solution, but it might not be the right solution. So her motivation is going to be somewhere in the middle, which means if if she has the ability to do it, she has to, it has to be fairly easy to do, otherwise she won't do it. Now motivation, I don't want to talk a lot about that today, but what I do want to share is ability. Because another way of thinking about ability is the resources that we have to do things, and the resources that are required to 
do things and to take any action at any moment, we need five resources. One is time. If Sally needs one hour to coach and she only has five minutes to coach, she doesn't have enough time. Two is concentration. If Sally needs to be very focused, and if you are coaching people, you need to be really focused. But poor Sally is stressed out, and she's pushing people to things. She's not going to have much concentration for it. Three, physical energy. If any of you have ever done coaching before, you know it is really exhausting. You have to be very focused. It is really draining. Sally's stressed out. She doesn't have much energy left for coaching. Social norms. This is the habits of the group. Now, her team, are they used to her coaching them? No, they're not used to her coaching them. If she suddenly starts coaching and says, let's have a one-on-one -on -one meeting, her staff are going to say, we never have one-on-one -on -one meetings. What are you doing? And there's going to be resistance. And then the next one is habits. Does Sally actually have any habits to support her in coaching? No. She doesn't have these habits anymore. So she needs to gain a lot of resources in order to make this leap. Now, coming back to Sally's example, we proposed coaching, we might have written a course outline, and it's got all of these things, active listening, asking questions, the robot, brain science, uh, challenging assumptions, and so on. But already looking at it, we know this is too much for poor Sally. So we need to simplify it. And really, the most realistic thing is active listening and asking questions. It's the simplest thing that she has the ability to do and will probably start to help her a lot. So, coming back to this model, there's one other thing that I didn't share just now, which is triggers. We only do certain actions, we only behave in certain ways when there is something to remind us to behave in that way. We eat because our stomach tells us, I'm hungry. We come home and we might turn on the TV because we see the sofa and we want to relax. We might step out of the office during break time and we see our colleagues smoking and that triggers us to start smoking. Any behavior has a trigger. And we need to make sure that if Sally is going to develop these new habits, then we have developed enough triggers for her to sustain these habits. And so a trigger might be something like a simple reminder. Now, for reminders, we have two types of memory. Um, one is memory in our heads, and another is memory in the environment. A quick question for you. In a minute, I'm going to ask you uh, to raise your hand if your answer is yes. If you have ever forgotten anything in your life, Maybe you forgot where you put the car keys. Maybe you forgot you had a meeting at 4 o'clock yesterday. Maybe you forgot to pick up your children from school. Maybe you even forgot you had children. If you have ever, if you have ever forgotten anything in your life, please raise your hand. Okay. Everyone forgets things. Our brains are unreliable. Our memories are unreliable. And if we design training with the hope that people will remember things, that's a joke. They're not going to remember anything. And speaking realistically, I'm speaking with you here today. I'm sharing lots of things. Most of what I say, you won't remember. For most of you, the most I can hope is that some of you take away one or two key ideas. But what I see a lot of you are doing is taking photos. And that's fine. Because taking photos, we are now not depending on the memory in our head, we are now depending on the memory in our phone. And when we start to use the environment to remind us, this way, we won't forget anything. And so, let's not, let's not joke ourselves, let's not kid ourselves and hope that people remember anything from our training, because they won't. Our brains are too unreliable. Let's start using tools to help people remember things. And Tools are things like checklists, forms, processes, templates. A very famous example is pilots, people who fly planes. When they are doing their safety checks, 
before the plane takes off, they use checklists. They go through, they check everything, tick, 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 tick. Imagine if they didn't use checklists. Imagine if they just used their memory. And they were going through the checklist and I, I, I think we're good to go. Yeah, yeah, probably. And start flying, ah, forgot to add fuel. Ah. It's not gonna happen because they know it's important. And so if they know it's important, we're not gonna depend on our memories to remember it. But training is important as well. You invested time, your time is valuable. You've invested money as well. So let's not pretend it's not important. Let's start using tools to help us remember. And there are three ways that tools can help us. And I call this the three P's of application. One is to plan before we apply. Another is a tool we can actually use whilst we are applying. And another is a tool we can use after we've done it to evaluate how well we did. So for Sally, if we want her to ask more questions and listen more, we might be able to give her a tool to plan when she could do that in her day. If we want her to ask more questions or listen more, actually, it's quite difficult to do in the moment. You might be able to write something on her hand uh, so that she sees it and reminds herself. And another thing is post-evaluate. If we want her to ask more questions and listen more, then at the end of the day, she can check, did I do this? Yes or no. So for Sally, two great tools to help her. One, it's just a simple post-it note on her desk, on her computer, just to remind her, today, I need to listen more. Very simple, low effort, high impact. And then at the end of the day, a form she has to fill in, did I listen more? Ah, no, I forgot, ah, I'll do it tomorrow. This way, at least we have something to help us remember. Now, when we design these tools, this is the, the final thing that I can share with you. We have to be careful of who we get to come and design these tools. Now, we might want to find experts to help us design our training, because experts are great. Experts do things really, really effectively. But experts are use the application and the application context analyze the application context, think of the time, actions, environment, feelings, people. Three, use tools to help them plan, perform, and post-evaluate. Um, four, for each step in the training, give them lots of time to reflect and to practice, to help them master the what, why, when, and how of each step. And finally, the thing about practical training is you never get it right the first time. You have to keep refining until you finally meet everybody's expertise. So, thank you very much everybody uh, for listening to my talk today. If any of you are interested in learning more, I have 10 free copies of my book. I'll be at CJ's booth over there. And if you would like to learn more, um, this is my, my WeChat, my email. Feel free to connect with me and ask me any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Hang on, hang on. Don't, 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 don't go yet. Uh, questions? I know we're running late, but still questions. Yes. Hey, thank you very much. You talked about social norms as being something that could be helpful for training or something that could be a challenge. When I was younger, I went through a training. We all thought training was great because it was exactly what we needed. As you talked about our motivation, that's what we wanted, that's what we needed. And we actually saw results from it. However, our leadership didn't totally agree with it. So even though we saw some successful results, the management then said, this isn't us. This isn't our identity. We want to go back to what we were. Have, do you notice that companies do this quite often? And in your experience, how do you then approach them? And who do you approach to buy into this so that the change and the success they see continues to move forward with their organization? Yeah, great question. And thank you for your question. And um, training can only solve, solve certain problems. With that particular issue, that's actually an organizational issue. And uh, training is never going to solve that issue. That needs um, real uh, organizational structure to change, might need leadership to change. Um, if, if we take Sally's coaching example uh, as an example, we want her to start coaching other people. But if she is the only manager in her organization that 
coaches and no one else coaches, then the social norms are resisting that change. So yeah, we need to make sure that when we design or deliver the training, the change we want to happen is supported by those social norms. And if, like in the situation you just shared, the leadership doesn't support it, then we should not do the training at all because it, it just won't work. We definitely need to be in place to support that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, um, I'm Eddie from EF. I actually have two questions. One is um, about intrinsic motivation. Um, what do you think is the best way to find out intrinsic motivation? Um, I know for different people it might be different, but is there any universal way that it would be easier to find intrinsic motivation? Yeah, um, simple question. What are your problems? What are your goals? Everyone cares about solving problems they have. Everyone cares about achieving goals they have. And so if you find the problems that they have, maybe they're too stressed out, maybe they're working too long hours, maybe they don't feel they have a good enough salary. And if you find the goals they have, I want to get promoted to this level in six months. I want to reduce my working hours by 20% within the next month. You find the goals that they have, all the problems that they have, you find their intrinsic motivation. It's that simple. Problems and goals. Yeah, it's more like a grow model. Uh, Reality and current situation. Yeah, you can. Um, that would come down into the, the, the goal part of, of the grow model, spending a lot of time clarifying what's the real issue you care about here. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, second question is. You have been doing a lot of training, right? Is there any like efficient way to measure the training results? Because most training is hard to quantify, right? So yeah. how do we measure the results? Right now, um, there is not really any particular way. <laughs> the best way is expectations. Um, did, did this training meet the learners' expectations? Do they say it helped them? are their stakeholders uh, saying, yeah, I'm quite happy with the change. That right now is the only way I can see to measure training effectiveness. Um, there are ways of measuring training ROI, and I'll tell you a quick story. I once measured training ROI in my previous job for a sales project we did. We took, because we had thousands of people who went through the sales training, we took data from the people who went through the training and the people who didn't go through the training. We compared their sales results six months before and six months after the training. And the interesting thing was that the people who didn't attend the training, their sales after the training were higher, which means that the ROI was negative. And when, when we measured this, I, I went to the vice president and I said, um, I don't think we should still do this training. The ROI is negative. The vice president said, well, Unfortunately, we have to do training because it's a legal requirement. <laughs> so, expectations. What is the expectation of the training? ROI, if we try and measure on that, it really is a waste of time. There's no way of measuring that. So focus on all of the stakeholders' expectations. What do they really want from this? Are they doing it? What do they want? Are they doing it? That's what you can do. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Time constraints, so um, well, we'd like to have the break in a while. Um, if you want to catch Jamie, Jamie has, as he had said, there are 10 free books, only 10. There are about 100 people here, so there's only 10 books available. Um, and he will be at our booth uh, right at the corner to sign the book for you. So, uh, and, and then he'll have to go to Beijing, which is why he's pressed this way. Uh, so, uh, can we put a round of applause for Jamie again?